So, uh, so today I'm going to talk about cycles of civilization uh, in, in uh, Mitru, and I'm going to give you sort of an overview of uh, our finds at uh, Mitru. Uh, so the Bronze Age and I early Iron Age settlement of Mitru, it's located on the south coast of the North, of the North European Gulf, which is over here, and here is Mitru, um, in, in the region called East Locris. Um, in central Greece. So Mitru is now a tidal islet because it was subs it subsided during the 1894 Atalanti earthquake. Uh, but before that, the site was located on a headland. And so sea level, the sea came before 1894, the sea came to about here. And so it was located on a headland. And even now by low tide, because the European Gulf has tides, you can actually walk over dry land and even drive a tractor over. Uh, so the site of Mitru um, has been the subject of systematic um, Greek-American excavations from 2004 to 2008, uh, co-directed by Eleni Zahu of the Greek Archaeological Service and, and me of the University of Tennessee. And after Eleni's untimely passing last year, uh, the co-directorship has been taken over by Efi Karantzali, who is the, uh, the head of the uh, archaeological effort of Theotida and Evritania. So Mitru is actually a semi-submerged tell site. Uh, it's about 3.6 hectares in area, and it had never been excavated before. Um, um, in 1988 and 89, um, a team from Cornell University under the direction of John Coleman and Bill Murray uh, carried out an extensive surface survey and they found Neolithic Bronze Age and later pottery, including high quality uh, pre-palatial pottery from the Mycenaean, early Mycenaean uh, pottery. And in the east and west scarps of the islet, they saw many levels of occupation, which you can see over here as well. Actually, I'm going to turn on my laser pointer, which is better. Uh, levels of occupation. And uh, so it was clear that this was a very important site for understanding the Bronze Age in this part of central Greece. And uh, no structures were visible on the surface, as you can see in this aerial photo of 1997. So we decided to first carry out a geophysical survey in order to determine the best locations to excavate. So in 2003 and 2005, um, the, uh, the Hiroris Sokas and his team of the University of, Se of Thessaloniki carried out an electrical resistivity survey in a sort of the northeast part of the, air, of the island, which is the open part. And then in the parts with the olive groves, they carried out a differential magnetometry survey. survey. And these uh, indicated that there were large building complexes buried uh, below the surface. Uh, and so this is where we put our main excavation sectors in the Northwest and in the Northeast. Um, I want to point out now that we have this picture up that uh, the uh, complex we found here, which we call building D, um, may, may have extended uh, all the way here uh, over a large part of the uh, Northeast area. We actually put a small trench over here, as you can see, and uh, these walls date to uh, late Helladic 2B, so late pre-palatial. Um, right, so this will, this will, um, this will um, play a role uh, later. Uh, so we also excavated some outlying trenches, and then we also documented, uh, in or, so in all we actually excavated only about 2.2% of the surface of the island, and so in order to get a better understanding of the island, uh, we also uh, documented the east and the western sea scarps of the island, where many, many levels are visible. Uh, and each of these scarps are about 35 meters long. And we did sort of small, drew them and then did, did uh, stratigraphic excavations. And uh, we also carried out an extensive, um, uh, an intensive, sorry, uh, surface survey of about 25% of the island. Um, so our results show that Mitru has traces of Neolithic occupation, uh, mostly from the late and final Neolithic, and then a long, seemingly uninterrupted stratigraphic sequence with about seven, 65 levels at present counting. And they range from early Helladic 2B, as you can see in this section of, trench, of the, a trench at the East Sea Scarp, uh, from early Helladic 2B to the late protogeometric, which uh, is, uh, you know, 
there was a, a grave uh, somewhere over here. So it, they go from uh, the occupation goes from around 2,500, 2,400 to 900 BC. And so having this long sequence has been very useful for developing a long pottery chronology for East Locris. Uh, we, um, so this is the first uh, long pottery chronology we have for East Locris. And thus far we have 38 ceramic phases. Uh, which you see here. And our sequence has especially been useful for subdividing the middle Helladic, uh, late Helladic 1 and late Helladic 3b. And uh, you can see here many names because, and of course, the work that I'm presenting today is the work of the uh, entire team of Mitru uh, with many, many um, specialists and also, of course, our excavators as well. And uh, I want to thank them here for their excellent work. So, so today I'm going to sort of provide an, an overview of the cycles of civilization as they've been, been identified at Mitru. So we have early Helladic to be, we have evidence for the corridor house civilization, then uh, that uh, collapsed uh, at, towards the end of early Helladic to be, and we had a Mitru reverted to a loosely organized rural, rural settlement that we can characterize as trans-egalitarian, this is Jim Wright's term. Uh, and then around 1700-1600, uh, at the beginning of late Helladic I, we begin the pre-palatial period when Mitru uh, seems to have been an independent, independent principality with a rising elite. And uh, we have now a hierarchical, more organized town. Uh, then in early late Helladic III to early, around 1370 BC, uh, we seem to become part of a state level Mycenaean palatial society, maybe first Orchomenos and then Thebes. Uh, then when the palaces collapse around 1200, we have a post-palatial period when Mitu again seems to have been sort of an independent, maybe a principality. Uh, there's evidence for an elite building. Uh, and then finally, uh, in uh, starting in late Helladic 3C late, so in the 11th century, uh, and going into the late proto-geometric, uh, Mitru is again a rural community, which uh, may have been trans-egalitarian. So I'm going to go quite fast over early, over the early and middle Bronze Age, but I will spend quite a bit of time um, discussing our evidence for this rising elite and, and uh, their basis of power. And then um, towards the end of the lecture, I will um, talk about the memorialization, memorialization of uh, the pre-palatial pre elite, which started uh, right at the beginning of the palatial period and went all the way to almost the uh, end of the occupation of Mitru. So um, in the early Helladic to B phase, Mitru's settlement has been identified all in these places. And so it may have uh, occupied uh, the northern part, the whole entire northern part of the island that perhaps even extended further south. Uh, we have excavated only very small parts, a trench here in the northeast corner, which had some, some flimsy walls. And then this trench, the, uh, a very deep trench, uh, LX784 on the eastern sea scarp. And this trench at the very bottom, just above sea level, um, had two uh, parts of two impressive buildings with fairly thick walls, uh, 65 centimeters thick. Uh, building N is at the bottom and then above it is building M. Um, so these two buildings had baked roof tiles. And you see an example over here. Um, and they also had a lot of fine dining pottery. And for the small areas that we have excavated, we had a lot of grinding stones and some grinding slabs chipped stone tools, and many large spindle worlds. You see an example right here. So this material is reminiscent of finds in the House of Tiles at Lerna and the Vices House at Colonna. And so is also the offset doorway of building M. Uh, but at this point, uh, we have excavated really too little to know whether buildings N and M were actually corridor houses or some other kind of important buildings. Uh, Kyle Jaswell's study of uh, our baked roof tiles has shown that they have similarities with the tiles of, from Zigurdias. In a submerged part of the site, because the site actually continues underwater to the uh, east and the west of the island. So over here, uh, Carol O'Neill, who has an eagle eye, has spotted a, uh, a clay seal um, which in style resembles early Helladic two and three uh, um, seals. So, um, so the find of this seal, seal suggests that Mitru was part of an administrative system. 
uh, the fine dining pottery found in uh, buildings N and M, but also here in the Northeast, are of Koraku style, but also of Lefkan Divan. Um, uh, so Mitru is currently the northernmost site where the corridor house civilization has been attested. Then with the dis destruction of building M, uh, uh, the, the site seems to have reverted back to a simpler uh, trans-egalitarian settlement. Uh, and we see drastic changes in architectural and burial practices, and that makes it seem possible that maybe a new population group entered at about this time. Um, a striking observation by Kyle Jasra is that mud bricks are now made with a very different uh, recipe than before. Uh, so they now, uh, we now see organic temper, we see different inclusions than before, and a new matrix. Uh, so this is the only drastic break in mud brick composition that uh, Jasra has observed in Mitu's entire history. And it indicates that the people who made bricks in the early Helladic tree and middle Helladic periods had a different mental template from the people making mud bricks before. Uh, there is also a change in rubble wall construction. Uh, after the destruction of building M, we have for a while, we have early Heladic, uh, one early Heladic 2B and then several uh, early Heladic 3 levels where we didn't uh, recognize any walls. Uh, maybe the sea had uh, destroyed them, or maybe they were so flimsy that we didn't recognize them. But the first rubble wall we have after this is the wall of building L, uh, which dates to the early Heladic three, middle Heladic one transition. And these walls are built in a very flimsy way. They're thinner than uh, the walls of building M, and uh, they're built with small stones that do not interlock. In fact, there is a large rubble core here. And uh, this wall actually uh, subsided because it was built so flimsily. flimsily. Um, so then throughout the remainder of the middle Heladic phase, rubble wall construction becomes again sturdier and they start to use uh, larger stones that then also start to interlock. So this sort of diachronic pattern in wall construction where you have strong walls in early Heladic 2B and then you know, flimsy walls perhaps in early Heladic 3 and then you go back to building again rubble walls, but first they're very you know, badly built and then they become better and better built. We see a pattern like that also at Lerna uh, within the early Helladic III phase uh, where uh, Betty Banks has argued that the new people may, come, may have come in who uh, did not, were not used to building permanent houses. And so we wonder if perhaps we have the same thing at Mitru. Another change that we see at Mitru and also in other uh, sites of um, the Greek mainland uh, is that there is a change in um, the um, in the layout of buildings. Uh, the buildings become much simpler than they were in early Helladic one and two, and there is also a change in the way you circulate through buildings. Uh, in early Helladic one and two, the, the ways you circulate to buildings are quite complex, while in early Helladic three and middle Helladic one, it's simple. Uh, doorways now are either at the center or near the center of a wall, while before they were to the side most of the time. And, um, you know, you just circulate through the house by just going straight through. But in, uh, in the United States, they call a, a gun, gunshot arrangement. Um, so, uh, so that's also a change, but it's, it's, I think it's a major change in how you, how you experience a uh, building. Uh, other changes in practices uh, are observed, uh, that are observed are uh, the introduction of wall plaster in early Helladic three and middle Helladic, and then in the rest of um, uh, Mitru's history. Um, and also we have for the first time tiled hearts uh, storage pits, and also intramural burials, like here we see a baby burial from early Helladic III. Um, so we don't have those uh, practices in the early Helladic IIb phase, but given that we have excavated so little of the early Helladic IIb, uh, we're not sure whether those features did not exist earlier. So Mitu's early Helladic III and middle Helladic settlements appear to have uh, been as extensive as the earlier settlement. So we find it in the same places. Um, so we have excavated middle Helladic remains primarily in two trenches in LX 784 right here, and then also in a deep, in a deep trench uh, in the Northwest sector in trench LE 792. In all, uh, 
these are about 50 square meters. And then we also, of course, have um, the remains of walls and roads uh, in the East and the West Scarp. Um, let's see. So in spite of this limited exposure, we can say that uh, overall, uh, the character of Mithrus Middle Helladic settlement is similar to that of many contemporary settlements in mainland Greece. It was a simple settlement, and it had what Rebecca Worsham has called a house series. So for instance, here is a house series of trench LX-784, where you have um, five buildings, uh, uh, each with several floors, uh, which were set not quite right on top of each other, but roughly in the same area. And we also have house series over here in uh, this uh, trench as well. Um, from the final mid middle Helladic phase onwards, we also see this alternation between residential phases and burial phases. And we see that um, cyst, pit or jar burials are made in the ruins of abandoned houses. Uh, and this continued into the late Helladic one phase. Uh, middle Helladic roads were narrow and they were made of uh, clay, um, which, were, which was reinforced with cobbles and gravel and trash, lots of animal, big animal bones as well, and pottery. Um, micromorphological analysis of uh, the uh, buildings has shown that um, the floors uh, of the floors has shown that they were frequently repaired and patched. Uh, as they had been in the early Helladic Hel three and early Helladic two B phases. And uh, Takis Karkanas, who carried out this analysis, uh, um, said that this, this kind of practice resembles what he has seen in the Near East at tell sites. Uh, we also have found the number of storage pits and tiled hearts and also one tiled oven over here. A curious practice that we have observed in building K was uh, in here in the East Scarp, was uh, the spreading of a, a sort of a pink daub, which seems to be a mixture of clay and lime. It's very, very bright pink. Uh, and they, they put it over the destruction, the first destruction of building K, and then they uh, rebuilt the building. And then when the building was destroyed again by fire, they covered the whole building with another one of these daub layers. Uh, the function of these daub layers is not so clear. It may have been practical to sort of make a sealant, maybe a subfloor, maybe to help drain water, uh, but especially this layer is very irregular. And so I wonder if perhaps it had more of a symbolic function to sort of seal off a uh, destroyed building. Uh, so, and I wonder if anybody in the audience uh, knows of uh, Comparanda for this, because I'd like to know. Then on a narrow road uh, in the Northwest uh, sector in this trench, we found all the way at the bottom, uh, the remains of a middle Helladic small boat, which was, uh, it was a wooden boat, uh, but the wood had disintegrated to the consistency of black earth, uh, what in Northern Europe one calls a boat stain. And so here you see uh, what it looked like when we realized what it was. And then this is um, the impression of the, the bottom of the boat after the black earth had been removed. So even though the settlement was seemingly egalitarian because uh, these buildings in this trench look similar to the buildings in this trench, um, and, uh, and the finds are, are all quite simple, um, there are some, so some households in the settlement at Mitru uh, may have been more prominent. And uh, for instance, in this trench, which is located below uh, the later pre-palatial elite building age, we found almost all the Egenitan in pottery imports here, uh, not in trench LX-784. And then over here, we also went, um, this is uh, uh, near uh, the later pre-palatial uh, elite center uh, D and its predecessor building T, um, we found below a final middle Helladic uh, building here, we found a gold leaf. Uh, so, you know, this is very little, but it sort of, you know, suggests that there may have been um, uh, at least two households in the settlement that were more prominent, but they did not stand out. And that's why uh, we call this settlement trans egalitarian. So in the subsequent pre palatial period, uh, which it literally goes from later on, like one to three or two early, those prominent uh, households ostensibly grew in status and wealth, and they began to profile themselves very visibly in the settlement. 
uh, to the construction of large elite centers, uh, building H and building T and D over here, um, and also elite graves, one here and one here, um, and also a network of long paved roads. And we'll, we'll talk more about those. Uh, and these roads were meticulously maintained, so there was no trash on these roads, unlike in the Middle Helladic period. So by, by building all this, uh, Mitrus Ali transformed the site into a hierarchical town. And I'm arguing that they materially constructed a new ideology of power. Uh, at the same time, at the East Sea Scarp over here, this Middle Helladic non-elite house series continued in, into Late Helladic 1 Phase 2. And so this is a, uh, our only non-elite uh, context. Uh, at the Middle Helladic 3, Late Helladic 1 transition, it housed the Potter's Kiln. So in Late Helladic 1 Phase 1B, uh, uh, sorry, in, phase, in Late Helladic 1 Phase 1, uh, Building H was constructed. Uh, in the Northwest sector. And to judge from the geophysical survey here, it was a large uh, complex of about 750 square meters. We have excavated eight uh, trenches into this complex, and we found rooms with different activities, all arranged around an urban courtyard over here. Uh, so, so far, building age behaves like a complex. Uh, there is evidence for two stories in the form of thick walls and the remains of flat roofs or second floors. Uh, and it also has bright white plaster floors. So all of that uh, make it, um, make it uh, seem like an elite building. And also we have finds here, like a very nice imported pottery again, and also a horse bridle piece, which also are elite finds. Um, so the detailed stratigraphic study of building H is still in progress. And so I cannot tell you much about how it developed over time. Uh, but we do know that architectural phases alternated with, um, uh, with uh, burial phases um, until the end of the late Helladic 1 phase. For instance, here you see a white plaster floor of late Helladic 1 phase 3 and then a pit grave uh, built into it. Um, so already in late Helladic 1 phase 1, uh, building H was flanked on the south by a, uh, a pebble and plaster road, um, so which is uh, one the first uh, road we have over here. Uh, and that's road three. Then in late Helladic one phase two, building T was constructed in this area, in the northeast sector. Uh, that building had a predecessor building U, which has been very little excavated and has no evidence for um, elite architecture, but we have very little. And building U had also architectural phases alternating with uh, burial phases. And so it may have been part of a house series. Uh, building T had four architectural phases, uh, all dating to late Helladic 1 phase 2. And it had elements of elite architecture in the form of bright white uh, plaster floors and cut stone bases. And here you see uh, a, one of these stone bases. Uh, I'm showing you here the third architectural phase, which is better known than the earlier phases. Um, and so this building, uh, we have exposed uh, over uh, 11 by 12 meters, but it must have been uh, larger and maybe even as large as the late, late, later building D. Uh, because um, several of its walls will be reused or have successors in building D. So from the little that we have excavated, we can see that we have the same walls over and over in building T in all the architectural phases. And so this is a, um, this is a radical departure of what we had in the house series where uh, a new building was not built right on top of the building using the same walls, but was built sort of the walls were nearby, were set nearby. Now we have the same walls which are used over and over. So we have much more of a permanent building now. Uh, we also no longer see an alternation between resi residential and burial phases here in building T. But building T did contain a permanent uh, tumulus. Now, the shape of the tumulus is not so clear, but because this is the only part we have excavated. Um, so this, this permanent tumulus, which we call tumulus one, was built after the demise of building U, and it will be visible all the way till the end of the pre-palatial period. So it was a very long-lived uh, tumulus. We have so far excavated one pit grave in it. 
Um, so it must have been an important uh, tumulus. So on the west building, T was flanked by uh, Road 1, which was a pebble and white plastic road, uh, which could not have been more than two meters uh, long because we don't see it in this late protogeometric water pit, which was dug all the way down into middle helladic levels. Uh, and so, you know, the space between this water pit and the first architectural remains is about uh, two meters. And the road ran horizontally at this time, which will change. So in late Helladic 1, phase 3, uh, building T was succeeded by building D. And uh, so this uh, building or complex has been excavated partially over an area of 16 by 17 meters, but it may have been much larger to judge by the geophysical survey. It has evidence for one or more grand rooms, as you can see over here, with extensive white plastered floors. So all these floors with the little sort of uh, marks are uh, white plastered. It also has the first evidence for uh, what I call megalithic walls at Mitu. Its south wall is 70 centimeters thick, and it was built with roughly cut limestone blocks about 60 centimeters long and 30 centimeters high. Now, these are not cyclopean walls, which are much, have much larger stones, uh, but this, these stones are much larger than anything that we see at Mitu before. So for the people at the time, they must, must have been impressive. Um, let's see. So tumulus one, as I said, remained visible in uh, building D, and then other tumulus may have con been constructed uh, in this earthen road, road two, uh, to the north of building D. Um, right. Um, and so now road one uh, seems to have been up to three meters wide because now it is sloping up as we can see over here in this sounding, we see it only in a sounding, uh, but we also see it now in the water pit over here. So road one went from here to at least here, but it's disturbed here. So it may have gone all the way till here, which is about three meters. So, uh, so the, the slope to the north is very interesting because, um, Oh, yes, uh, sorry. On the other side of the road, we have another building, building W, which may have been an elite building, but we have too, too little excavated to be sure at this point. Uh, so the um, slope up to the north is very interesting uh, because the geophysical survey uh, suggests that road one continued all the way for about 80 meters in a straight line. Uh, and I, um, um, Juliana Bianco has drawn it over here. This is what we excavated. Uh, where, it, where it would have ended here at this burial plot with uh, Elite Tomb uh, 51. Um, and so uh, the, the ground level slopes up, this area is at about 10 meters above sea level. And here we are at about four meters above sea level. So it sloped up um, um, to, the, to the north, to the north northeast. So we have also an other uh, pebbled road at this time, Road 5, which abutted uh, Building H uh, to the northwest. And now we also have quite a thick wall here, 70 centimeters thick, that um, was a perimeter wall of Building H. Um, so it seems that the roads, uh, the, the road network expanded over time. Uh, in late Helladic 1, uh, by late Helladic 1, phase uh, 3 or 4, road 2 was also pebbled and plastered, and it was 3 meters wide. Uh, and it met road, road 1 at a 90 degree angle. So this was uh, quite precise um, measuring. Um, and so road 2, as we can also see in the geophysical survey, we can see walls, and I can see it quite well, but you can see walls going sort of uh, along here. Uh, road uh, two again for about 60 meters, and it ends here in the Western Sea Scarp where we see it. So these are really long, um, wide uh, roads that we can see. Sorry about this. Okay. Uh, in late Helladic one, phase three, uh, we have another road which we call Road six. Uh, which was also pebbled and plastered. And we see that here in the Western Sea Scarp, uh, quite low above sea level, uh, at, at one, uh, one meter 05 above sea level. Um, 
And uh, this road was then in, uh, followed by another road level uh, at, one, at uh, 1.43 meters above sea level, uh, which is the, and this road level is dated to later Radic 1 to 2. Now, to judge by the geophysical survey, uh, this road would have run all the way or in a straight line to uh, building D. And so we have, when we have this road over here, it sort of ends at, at building D over here, and it met where it met road three, which was over here. So uh, I also want to draw your attention to this uh, coloring here of the west of the Western Sea Scarp. So just only a few a few about 10 meters further to the north, we found final middle heladic structures at 3 meters 60 above sea level, uh, just below the plow zone. And so late heladic one was much higher here. And here building H is at about four meters above sea level. And by this time it's at about, at, uh, by uh, late heladic one phase three, it's at 425 above sea level. So right here where uh, late heladic one is at one meter above sea level. So this means that there must have been some sort of bluff over here. And that road uh, building H was situated on a prominent bluff about three meters high, uh, overlooking uh, this bay over here. Nowadays, it's just sort of a continuous slope, but at that time, it was um, the, the difference in elevation was much more dramatic. Uh, so this attention to the Western Bay with a road that runs here and building H overlooking it uh, makes me wonder if this was not the, the site of the harbor of uh, Mitru. Uh, because on the other side, we have a lot of submerged reefs and so on. Over here, it is just free sailing. So this would have been an ideal place to have, to have the harbor. Of course, sea level would have been uh, lower, maybe six, seven, maybe even um, uh, 10 meters lower than it is now. Uh, we also found two elite graves. Um, a very large cyst grave, uh, tomb 51, was found in the northeast corner of the islet. It was largely robbed, but it can be dated by its stratigraphic position to late heladic one phase one or final uh, middle heladic. And it may have been covered by a tumulus to judge by the fact that other uh, ordinary sized cyst graves are packed all around it. And these cyst graves date to late heladic one, uh, phase one and two. Uh, so I think uh, the largest grave may have been of about the same period. Um, but unfortunately, uh, these graves are located just below the plow zone, so we could not ascertain that there was actually a tumulus covering it. If there was a tumulus covering it, it would make this grave plot really nicely visible from uh, the sea and also from um, other places on the mainland as well. Uh, let's see. Um, Right. Um, so it was this elite plot that was connected with building D via road one, uh, probably from late heladic one phase three onwards. Uh, then in late heladic one phase three or four, a much larger grave, which was a built chamber tomb, we call tomb 73, was constructed inside the northwest corner of the complex of building D. Uh, so it was an L-shaped built chamber tomb, and you can see here a beautiful isometric reconstruction drawing by Giuliana Bianco. It's a little hard to see here, but here is a tomb chamber and the drum was over here before we excavated it. Um, so it was um, surrounded by a funerary enclosure, which is very, stands out very much, uh, which is 13.25 by 8.5 meters in area. Uh, soil micromorphological research has shown that most or all of this funerary complex was roofed. Uh, the tomb chamber had been dug deeply uh, down into buildings T and U, and it was lined with mud brick walls and, um, and green sandstone orthostates. And you can see here a mud brick wall, and here you see two of those orthostates. Uh, our detailed stratigraphical research has demonstrated that the dromos of uh, tomb 73 um, did not have straight but flaring walls, and it projected much further into the road than previously thought. Sorry, I'm going to put my phone away.
sorry about that. I turned it off, but it still yeah, goes. Um, so it, um, it, it projected much further, about two meters. So it took up about half of the road over here. Uh, and, and over here, the road may have been about four meters wide. So it really intruded up on road one. Um, about halfway the dramas, there was a line of support bases, probably three support bases, um, and a clay ridge about seven centimeters high, which you can see over here, which I've interpreted as a symbolic uh, threshold. Uh, and so this drama sloped down from the road into the tomb. Into the tomb. Um, south of the uh, main tomb chamber, which is over here, there was a small chamber uh, which at a later stage was also used for burials. Uh, there's evidence for two staircases, two short staircases in this room and in the dromos, which then give access to the area of the enclosure. Um, let's see. Um, so all these passageways are only about 60 centimeters wide, which suggests to me that access to these areas was restricted, presumably to uh, intimates and uh, servants. Uh, in contrast, a very wide doorway, uh, 1.70 meters wide, gave access to the funerary enclosure from road two, which now was pebbled and plastered. Uh, and uh, this doorway led into, there were probably two steps here, they led into a really nice appointed uh, room, and there was a second room over here with bright white plaster floors and a large D-shaped hearth, uh, and there was a linear disturbance over here in the white plaster, which may have been a partition wall, and to the south of it was a uh, built stone platform um, which was at least 1.65 meters long by 1.20 meters wide. Um, we have found too little in those rooms to determine their function, but because we have this really wide doorway, 1.70 meters wide, and nice wide floors, big hearth, uh, that all suggests that uh, these rooms hosted gatherings by groups of elite people uh, in relation to funerary rit rituals. Uh, the large stone platform, the platform was actually large enough to have been used to prepare the dead body or laid out in ectuses. Uh, further south, the area within the enclosure uh, was very disturbed, but the southeast corner here seems to have been used by uh, burials. And we have a possible cyst burial and a pit burial, and they were marked by an, a roughly cut upright uh, stele. Uh, the area east of uh, this funerary enclosure was entered from road two by another uh, wide doorway. And there was a large uh, space over here. And then south of it, there were two small rooms and another set of uh, rooms over here where we found hearts. This small room alone had two hearts, pebble hearts, and then this one had another one. Um, so because there are so many hearts here, uh, this seems to have been a kitchen area, and uh, perhaps it uh, served these elite commensal gatherings over here uh, inside a funerary enclosure because uh, the pottery assemblage uh, over here included um, vases with a ritual character, and this is a study that's still in progress by uh, Salvatore Vitale. So then after a fire destruction of uh, this complex and also building H in the late Hellenic 2B phase, uh, building D and tomb 73 were rebuilt, but with some modifications. Uh, the tomb chamber was expanded to the south um, and uh, was paved with white plaster. Uh, the southern part of the chamber was still separated from the rest by an arrangement of um, stone slabs that uh, may have carried columns or pillars in some sort of rough pier and door arrangement. Um, there, are, there is no evidence for uh, doorways, uh, but these openings uh, seems to have been um, um, blocked by stones after each uh, burial. And we found a, a bunch of stones over here and over here. So this added a touch of monumentality uh, to the tomb. Uh, the dromos was now shorter, they may have thought that this very long dromos was really not a good idea. Um, so the dromos is uh, shorter and it's narrower and a little, little less flaring than the previous one. And like its predecessor, it had a uh, low clay ridge, which now is 20 centimeters high, 
uh, across its width, uh, which may have formed a symbolic threshold. Uh, south of the tomb chamber, Tumulus I was still visible, uh, but it was no longer accessible from the chamber. In the previous uh, phase, oh, sorry, I, I should. Um, in the previous phase, there was actually a doorway here, I forgot to point that out. Um, so the stone stealing out to the southeast was covered by loose earth, which presumably was a tumulus, but it was very disturbed. Uh, so it was hard to tell. Uh, the area to the north may now also have been used for burials, uh, but it was, it was very disturbed again. But here we found 15 human bones. Further north, the meeting room for uh, these elite rituals, presumably, was now closed off and turned into sort of a simple room. Uh, and so the elite gatherings now may have taken place over here, which now has, this area now has nice white plastered floors and would have been accessible from uh, the dromos. Um, the corners of the funerary enclosure were marked with roughly cut steely, um, which we have found at three corners and probably uh, we have it over here as well, but uh, this was very disturbed because this corner would have been a major corner since uh, people would have come on the road one. Uh, this would have been the first uh, corner they saw uh, as, they, as they approached uh, the funerary enclosure. And so there probably was a stele as well. Uh, so east of the funerary enclosure, uh, the small rooms were replaced by one large room, which again had two hearts, two large hearts, which were, um, and we have now uh, cooking pottery and again ritual drinking pottery. So this again suggests that this room was not just a simple kitchen, but also an area for preparing rituals. And the, the large size of the kitchen and the hearts suggest that they served larger commensal gatherings than before. Uh, west of building D, uh, building uh, W was um, su succeeded by building F, uh, which clearly had an elite character. Uh, of its initial construction phase, we only have uh, identified a few parts, uh, but uh, um, later in late Helladic 2B or in 3A1, uh, the eastern wall uh, of uh, the facade wall of building F was extended further south, and now we have a staircase over here and a, uh, a, a wide doorway, 1.60 meters wide. Uh, and this staircase here has a return, meaning that you know, building F had at least two floors. Uh, the return may have gone to a, even a third floor or perhaps more likely a, uh, a roof, a flat roof. Um, so the eastern leg of the staircase was shorter than the western leg, which tells us that the upper floor uh, had taller ceilings and uh, was grander than the first floor. Uh, to the north of the staircase, there was a kitchen area. Uh, and we found uh, four cooking pots here. And uh, here in uh, the Soto Scala, so below this staircase over here, the staircase went up like this and then had to return like that. So in the Soto Scala area, um, we have... Um, uh, it seems to have been used as a pantry for food and pottery. In all, we found uh, 19 restorable vases in this entire area over here. Um, so foods prepared here may have been carried to the grand second floor um, and, um, and uh, ritual activities may have taken place over here, as is suggested by the find over here of um, pottery with ritual character like uh, these um, um, you know, we have uh, yes, this, this um, stemmed cup over here, I probably is not probably not the right word, with a loop handle. So these vases with loop handles. Um, the unusually wide doorway of building F was exactly centered on the dromos, as you can see over here. So it seems likely that building F was closely connected to building D, and its ritual gatherings may have been related again to uh, tomb 73. So the finds from the elite centers and from tomb 73 testify to the wealth and the warlike character of Mitru's uh, pre-palatial leaders. And it is clear that they distanced themselves from the rest of their population by flaunting their richer lifestyle. So I've called them uh, the beginning of a networked elite. So uh, one of the ways they set themselves apart was through their transportation. Uh, they uh, appear to have used uh, 
horse-drawn chariots, as is demonstrated by the find of this uh, uh, horse bridle piece made of deer antler uh, in building H in a late Hellenic one phase four uh, destruction level. They also uh, must have worn purple or purple trimmed clothes, as is indicated by the presence of uh, many crushed murex shells in and around the courtyard of uh, building H. Uh, and so this is indicative of purple dye production. Uh, and we also found a lot of ceramic spools, which suggest that, you know, the purple may have been used to dye wool, uh, wool thread, which then could have been used to embroider uh, or decorate um, uh, clothing. Um, they also wore uh, imported jewelry, including gold and amber, and you see here part of an amber bead. Uh, they used imported pottery, bronze, and electron vessels, and they enjoyed elite cuisine, as is indicated by the find of special cooking pottery. And presumably an elite woman was uh, buried with a faience spindle whirl in uh, building uh, in, in tomb 73. Uh, we have not found swords or spears in tomb 73, uh, but we have found two obsidian uh, arrowheads and a bronze arrowhead and small gold and silver nails, presumably from decorated swords or daggers. And then, of course, a find of uh, nine uh, perforated boar's tusks, which were used for, uh, for boar's tusk helmets, also demonstrate the warlike character of Mitrus elite. Here are finds mostly from the second phase of, of Tomb 73, which was robbed. Uh, and here is some of some imported pottery uh, from Aegina and from the area of Mycenae uh, found in building H and also in tomb 73. And these ones are from tomb 73. Um, Mitro's elite also showed off its exceptional status through the size and the wealth and possibly the location of its um, graves. Uh, and especially of tomb 73, uh, because the area north of building D was at this point abandoned by uh, residential occupation. And to all appearances, it, uh, it, it, it was turned into a communal cemetery. Now we need to verify this by uh, digging more in here, but certainly this house series ended and now we have permanent uh, graves over here. And of course this grave plot was permanent as well. Uh, and there is one grave here close to the surface as well, uh, which was uh, hard to date. Um, so if this was the case, if the people of Mitru now were burying their dead in a communal cemetery, then the location of tomb 73 within the complex of uh, building D would have formed a very visible exception to the new rule. And the fact that the dromos of uh, tomb 73 was giving out, was uh, um, located right on road, uh, road one would have made that exception even more visible. It would have rubbed it in basically. So the result of all this was a hierarchical townscape. And in order to better convey these effects, I've asked an architect, uh, Darius Korajon, to make digital models of the middle Hellenic and the late Hellenic one towns. Of course, we have excavated very little of those. And so much had to be extrapolated on the basis of the geophysical survey or just assumed. Uh, so please, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this to prepare you. So please don't look at the details, but look at the overall effects of these uh, reconstructions. So this would have been the town um, uh, of Mitu in the Middle Hellenic period. And in fact, this area, um, yeah, this is based on other Middle Hellenic uh, sites. Uh, and then this is Late Hellenic one with the large roads, uh, white, of course, uh, the elite centers, which we made wide. Um, don't know whether they were actually white plastered. Um, and then uh, at least one tumulus, and there may have been a second one over here. So the new roads, if you compare those two, and, and the color here should be actually more drab, uh, the drab mud color. Um, so if you look at these overall effects, you can sort of see how the new roads in later Logic one brought a sense of order to the settlement and they linked all the imported parts, the elite centers, the elite tombs, uh, and maybe this one as well, and then the harbor. So these new roads, because they were uh, three times wider than the middle Hellenic roads, they brought a sense of openness and created new vistas from one important locale to the other, including places of memory, the graves that were important 
to the elite. So they really made their, their uh, stamp, put their stamp on the settlement. We do not know what the new elite ideology was, but it may well have been related to bringing order into chaos and maybe cleanliness into dirt, the dirt world, uh, and whiteness into a drab world. The new hierarchical landscape certainly threw out the old myth of egalitarianism. And in this new landscape, building age stood out uh, because of its lofty position on this three meter high bluff. Now, what is interesting is that the road that connects building H to building D is located not on the safe inland side, but is located right on the edge of the bluff, which is not a smart choice, but they did it on purpose, I think. Uh, because if uh, the elite was, um, um, when the elite was um, uh, traveling from building H to uh, building D, they would have been very, very visible uh, to everybody here at the, in the site and also from further away, especially when they were riding horse-drawn chariots. Uh, so all of this, I think, uh, indicates that the theatrical was very important to Mitru's elite. And so given the great visibility of these roads, I think it's no far stretch to imagine that they were used for processions uh, funerary processions and other ones. And so, and so this also, to me, um, reminded me of a great article by Josef Maran about the theatricality of power uh, with respect to the later palace at Mycenae. So it seems to me that already Mitru's elite was sensitive to the theatricality of power. Uh, and so these public rituals, processions, and other performances would have also have enhanced the social significance of Mitru's new townscape and would have imbued it with new memories. So this new townscape, I think, would have created a new world for Mitru's inhabitants, but it was also a townscape of social inequality. And, and of restrictions, social restrictions, because the northern side of the of the of the, the northern part of the site was now occupied with elite buildings, presumably with restricted access to commoners, but also the white plastered roads may have been restricted to the elites, because micromorphological analysis of roads one and two have shown that the plaster surfaces were very little used. Uh, and these roads are reminiscent of the later palatial period, long roads at Dimini, which are lined with walls and which were accessible only from Megara Alpha and uh, Beta over here. So only accessible to the elite. So if this were the case also at Mitru, then the impact of the new townscape would have been profound because uh, by forcing elites and non-elites to engage with its restrictions and codifications on a daily basis, this built landscape would have contributed to the internalization of social inequality and social roles by both elites and non-elites. Now, these long roads with restricted access may belong to the vocabulary of power typical of this area of Greece, because there is also an other site, Kalapodi um, Kastri Suvalas, uh, which is about 20 kilometers west of Mitru, which has them as well. Um, but also the uh, construction of the elite complexes and the elite rooms and the burial practices in the late Hellenic one phase are, can be characterized as local. So we seem to have a local elite culture at first. Then by the late Hellenic 2A phase, Mitru's elite began to import large amounts of Mycenaean fine pottery which has resulted 90% of its fine vases were now Mycenaean lustrous decorated. So this openness to things Mycenaean appears to have led to the Mycenaeanization of Mitru's elite beginning in the late Hellenic 2B phase. Now they were buried with the entire package of Mycenaean type grave goods. And by the late Hellenic 3A2 phase, they also conducted Mycenaean type rituals in building F. So this Mycenaeanization, I think, was voluntary and not imposed from the outside uh, because of the continued use of the elite complexes and of tomb 73. The power of Mitru's leaders may in part be based on the site location on a uh, busy maritime trade route in the North European Gulf. So Mitru's leaders may have enriched themselves through trade, and perhaps they were not averse of attacking passing ships every once in a while as well. 
um, Mitru also dominated the natural passageway uh, by land between the main Locrian plain over here um, and the Copaic Basin, which runs here through a narrow strip of land between the mountains and the sea. And you can see it here. Of course, sea level must have been lower, but still this strip of land was quite narrow. Uh, so choke points such as these could have been exploited by Mitru's elite for exacting tolls or demanding payment for military protection. Mitru's elite appears to have suffered a catastrophic military defeat early in the early Helladic 2b phase, so uh, uh, early, Hel early Helladic 3a2 phase around 1370 BC. The elite centers were destroyed by fire and entirely or largely abandoned. Tomb 73 was plundered and went out of use as well. The settlement was not abandoned because we have found high quality late Helladic 3A2 and uh, 3B pottery in many areas, but the center of power must have moved elsewhere uh, at the site. So all these changes have been interpreted by me as signs that the site was taken over by an outside palatial power, most likely neighboring or homonos. Our recent stratigraphic research, and uh, I want to thank especially Juliana Bianco here, who has worked with me on this detailed um, stratigraphic analysis. Um, so this research has shown that it was after this destruction and not before that the funerary complex of uh, tomb 73 was filled with a tumulus. In fact, there were two episodes of tumulus construction. First, uh, the destruction debris in the dromos and in the southern part of the tomb chamber was shaped into a mound, and this was covered by a thick layer of hard red-brown clay, uh, and it varied between 5 and 35 centimeters in thickness. We have identified some patches of this clay, but it must have been uh, everywhere. Um, and you can see, actually, you can see a layer of this tumulus right here, and you can see it right here as well. Um, so the reddish clay was not found in the northern part. In fact, the northern part must have been open at this time. It was roofed, but it was uh, not filled in. Um, so it was cleared and roofed, and bones and grave goods were um, must have been gathered in here. Uh, north of Building D, uh, a new tumulus was uh, put in, tumulus 2, and it was also covered by this uh, red-brown uh, clay layer. And we find the red-brown clay layer also over tumulus 1, and below it, we found actually the destruction debris from the tomb. So tumulus 1 must have gotten a new layer of clay now, and also the, uh, the burials over here seem to have gotten red-brown clay layers. So the similarity of all these layers suggests that they were all of the same date, and they were perhaps meant to seal off desecrated grave areas. After this, the burn destruction of the entire funerary complex was made into an earthen tumulus, a low earthen tumulus, of which some traces uh, remain here in the north. And you can see it over here. On top of the edges of this tumulus, they put lines of rubble right here. So what we thought was a thick wall was, in fact, the wall is only up to here. So the interior of it is actually rubble set on top of the uh, tumulus. Um, Right. So the entire tomb complex of uh, tomb 73 was now turned into a funerary monument. So it was no longer used as a grave, but it became a funerary monument to the dead pre-palatial leaders who had been buried here. Already in uh, the late Helladic 3 to early phase, we see a frequent relaying of pebbled and white plastic surfaces of road one, and you can see them over here. So we have actually three surfaces already in late Helladic 3A2 early, and then several more in late Helladic 3A2 middle and late. So I've estimated that they laid a new surface about every three or four years. Then from, um, yes, and then so, so these roads also saw very little use. Uh, and then in late Helladic 3B1 uh, to 3, uh, uh, 3B1 early to 3B, wait, to 3B2 early, we have absolutely no activity in the road. Uh, we also have no, no uh, uh, building activity elsewhere at uh, Mitru where we have excavated. So, but we still have pottery from that period. So what I, uh, what I have proposed is that perhaps a large part of the population, the people who were doing this road laying, 
were not here. So the site was still occupied, but a large part of the population may have been moved elsewhere. And this is exactly the time when the Copaic Basin was um, drained uh, further south. And the Copaic Basin is only about 15, 20 kilometers to the south. So perhaps, um, yeah, so perhaps, um, Right. I, yes, I will. I will. So, yeah, I will talk about this later. Sorry, I, I ran a little bit ahead. So, in a late Helladic Trier to middle, uh, the area uh, of building D east of the funerary comp complex was rebuilt, and we have a new uh, room with a one large heart now, uh, which is again in that kitchen area, and again the pottery here is suggestive of rituals. So it appears that rituals were resumed. Uh, possibly by a smaller number of participants, because we now have only one hearth, yeah. and in uh, simpler circumstances. Uh, part of building F adjacent to uh, uh, road one was rebuilt as well, uh, together with the staircase and the kitchen area. And so again, maybe there were now again rituals in relation to uh, the activities right here in the, in the road. So this episode of reuse ended in a series of burn destructions in buildings F and D, dated to late Helladic 3A2 middle, and then again in 3A2 late uh, and 3B1. Uh, this may actually have been the same destruction, 3B1 early, actually. Uh, the tumulus of, of uh, tomb 73 apparently was not affected at this time. After this, so we have no uh, architectural or ritual activity for most of the 13th century. Um, and so this hiatus I find is very curious, and I've suggested that uh, during this time, a large part of Mitru's population may have been moved here by Orchomonos for the draining of uh, parts of the Copaic Basin and the working of the land, and maybe also to serve in the army. Uh, of course, it's also possible that the focus activity of activities at Mitru now took place in an unexcavated area of the site, but still, why did they stop? Uh, laying these surfaces of road one. Then in late Helladic 3B2 late, uh, it seems that people came back and road one again receives its an, an pebble and plastic surface, the last one. And we have a monumental facade built here, uh, which was later destroyed. And this, uh, this facade was built in stone. Um, we have a large destruction dump here in near the southern boundary of our excavation area, which included a, an assemblage of high quality late Helladic 3B2 late pottery with Theban characteristics. And this indicated, this indicates that there was an elite building nearby. We also found uh, several uh, fragments of roof tiles. Uh, Salvatore Vitale on the base of, uh, basis of this has proposed that Mitru may now have belonged to the area of Thebes because glass was destroyed by this time and presumably or Khamenos, but Thebes was, uh, the palace of at Thebes was still going. So the late Helladic 3B2 late uh, phase ended in an other episode of burn destruction and tomb 73 and its complex were ransacked again and the monumental facade was destroyed and you see it lying over here. Sometime in the late Helladic 3C early phase, the destruction debris in the dromos and the southern part of the tomb chamber was leveled out and a hard cement clay floor, there were actually two clay floors, were laid over it. The northern part must have been a separate chamber because it remained, uh, uh, it was roofed and it remained um, sort of um, uh, un unfilled. Um, on the gray floor, we found many cobbles and also animal bones and some pottery. And the animal bones are mostly deer bones and mostly the extremities of the bones. And I thank Paul Halstead for uh, identifying those. Uh, so this suggests that special meals were held over here. Then on top of this gray floor, so we have um, uh, five more um, um, uh, floors, clay floors, all dating to late Helladic 3C middle. So we have one gray floor. Uh, then we have also, uh, sorry, we, we have uh, a blue and we, we color coded them to make it more clear, a blue, a purple, uh, orange, then yellow and uh, green. Uh, and you can, in the, in the earliest phases, this, um, so all these floors uh, belonged to roofed structures. This is what micromorphological analysis has shown. 
Uh, but and we have in the first phases we have rather flimsy walls, uh, mud brick walls. But over time, this structure, so this was a roofed structure, it gets stronger walls uh, and it becomes larger. And it, so it seems like more they over time they take more and more away from the tumulus. Uh, so this structure we call uh, building X. Uh, most of its floors were found empty, but in the third floor, the orange floor, we found uh, what seems to be the remains of a platform with a uh, seal, and, um, and a, um, uh, a seal of the, of the uh, mainland poplar group was lying on it, and nearby we found a greenstone silt. Um, we also have, um, uh, we also saw that uh, the floors were often pitted and then covered by another floor. And the function of these pits is not so clear, but it is possible. Uh, I would suggest that maybe there, there could have been libation pits. Of course, it's, it's a very, very little evidence. Um, so it really looks like Building X was not a normal house. It, it seems to have been a ritual uh, structure. Uh, with rituals carried out in relation to tomb 73. Um, so in the fourth phase, uh, when uh, the, uh, the structure was expanded to the north, this uh, platform, the former platform here, was partially reused, and they put here an upright slab and another sort of, the, the wall here now served as some sort of platform, and there was a little enclosure over here. So there is something special going on here. And then in the fifth phase, they put a stone platform over here in the Northwest uh, uh, area, which seemed to have been sort of a Northwest chamber at the time. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and also I want to remark that uh, when, when we have floors here over the North tomb chamber, they're made out of white plastic as well. So there seem to be you know, a, a rituals carried out in building uh, X, which are focused on the tomb and especially on the North tomb chamber. On top of building X, uh, a new structure was built, which we call uh, building B, and it's reused in part uh, the funerary enclosure. You can see it over here and over here. So it has now, again, rubble wall sockets, uh, and it dates still to late Helladic 3C middle. Uh, building B reused the northern entrance over here, uh, and um, it's, it also reused several interior walls of building X, so it was to all appearances its successor. Uh, it was more grandly built with new stone walls and white plaster floors in most areas. So we have seven architectural phases here in late Helladic 3C middle, which means that you know, we have about seven years per phase, which is also very, very fast. Uh, by the late Helladic 3C late phase, uh, in the early 11th century BC, uh, Mitru assumed again a simple rural character with isolated flimsy buildings and a return of intramural cyst graves. Over the ruins of building B, we have a very small apsidal structure that was set uh, exactly over the north tomb chamber we call building J. It had white plastered walls and inside it, it had a lot of uh, unusual animal bones, including the bones of a large cat. And I thank Megan Dennison for this identification. Building J definitely, it also had some sort of enclosure here. It definitely was not a normal house, but it seems to have been a ritual structure. And then later in the same phase, we have two, two buildings, building Z, which is below here, and then building C, which are rectangular structures set over the Northwest chamber. Uh, building Z was not enough preserved to tell its character, but building C definitely was a ritual structure because we have more than 20 uh, small miniature handmade bowls here, some uh, larger chalices and a kylix, and also a cooking pot with the stacked thigh bones of six uh, piglets. So like many other settlements in the Euboean Gulf region, Mitru was not abandoned at the Bronze Age Iron Age transition. And in the early protogeometric phase, we have a new apsidal building, uh, building A, which was constructed inside the southern room of building, the ruins of the southern room of building uh, B, um, and over tomb 73 again. So building A may have been a leader's dwelling and its location may have been purposely chosen to link the new leader to Mitru's pre-palatial elite. Because before its construction, 
a careful entry was made into the North Tomb Chamber. And I want to emphasize this, a pit was made over here and part of the North wall of the Tomb Chamber was dismantled. And then they went into the tomb because we find everywhere, we find early proto-geometric remains. Now you have to imagine that building J was still there and its plastic floors were still there. So they really went very carefully here, not disturbing building J. So this was not robbing. I think this was a deliberate, careful entry to perhaps to retrieve things from the tomb. Uh, we will never know for certain uh, what if anything was taken from the tomb, but the fact that then, then the chamber later on was filled in and after the destruction of building A, this location no longer had any speci special significance suggests to me that they took out important things like perhaps bones of the pre-palatial elite. Uh, and maybe they were then placed inside building A. Um, and after that, the tomb lost its importance. The, the last structure uncovered at, at Mitru, the latest structure was rectangular building E. And the upsidal part of building A was now turned into a courtyard and it was used for purple dye uh, construction. So clearly it has lost all ritual significance. Now, to conclude, it seems to me that the longevity of all these acts of ritual and memory focused on tomb 73, which started around 1370 and may have ended as late as 940 BC, because building A went out of use sometime early in the late proto-geometric phase, I think it is remarkable. And it could signal that we are dealing with a rare example, uh, not just of memor memorialization, but of hero cult, which would have started already in the late Bronze Age and continued into the early Iron Age. Then sometime later, uh, in the late proto geometric phase, the settlement was abandoned. So to thank, I would like to thank all our sponsors and supporters who have made the Mitu project possible. And I want to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>